Open your Bible to the book of, you got it, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And at first we want to examine what happened when God had spoken the Ten Commandments. Which actually, you know, the Bible says, actually he spoke the Ten Words. And if you count, it's very easy to see that the Ten Commandments, as written in stone, contain more than 10 words. So when it says that he spoke the 10 words, you could also translate the 10 ideas, the 10 principles, so to speak. Because God always wanted to say, when he said, thou shalt not commit adultery, he, he did not only want us to say, oh, I never committed adultery, I'm fine. That was the attitude of the Pharisees. But he wanted us to listen, to think, man, what does this mean for my thoughts, right? So there are 10 principles that go deeper than the letters of the words are saying. And by the way, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount was precisely trying to do that. The people just saw the letters, but he wanted them to understand the principle. Now, when God spoke all these words, he actually only spoke them first and did not write them down. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we want to see what happened then. Verse 23, and now you need to be very attentive and very careful in listening because this is really interesting what is being said here. Verse 23, so it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire that you came near to me all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire we have seen this day that God speaks with man, yet he still lives. Okay, stop here. So the people are saying, we have heard the voice of God and we still live. Can you see that? Very simple. Next verse. Now, therefore, why should we die? What? Okay, again. They said... We have heard the voice of God and we live. Therefore, why should we die? Do you think that's strange? Yeah, that's very strange. These verses here are very strange. Keep, keep listening. For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. So here are the people saying, we have heard the voice of God and we live. Therefore, if he talks more to us, we will die. Does that make sense? I mean, when God spoke his words, did he actually try to kill them? Came God from heaven saying, this day I want to kill all my people. Was this his intention? But did he want to kill something? Yes. He came to kill, but not the people. But they misunderstood. Next verse. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived. In other words, like, who could actually ever listen to the voice of God? Now listen. Next verse. Moses, you go near and hear all that the word our God may say, and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you, and we will hear and do it. What? They're saying, what human being could listen to the voice of God and still live? It is impossible, right? Therefore, Moses, could you please go? <laughs> what? They are saying, no human being made of flesh and bone can listen to the voice of God. It's dangerous. It will die. Uh, Moses, please, could you go? <laughs> Moses, have you, are you made out of flesh and bone? These people knew in their hearts that you could listen to the Lord and not die. In their heart, they knew it was possible for Moses. They did not want to kill him. They knew this man, Moses, made of flesh and bone, can stand in the presence of the Lord and will not be consumed. Which was a very soft acknowledgement 
that something was wrong with them. Can you see that? They understood that God loves them, but they now saw that the love of God almost feels like a threat. Because the true love of God is threatening your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because the true love of God is a consuming fire and it will consume every idol of your heart. And suddenly people that said, Lord, help me. Lord, make me healthy. Lord, give me a workplace. When he comes and you realize, oh, no, no, he's not only health, making me healthy and he's not only giving me a workplace and he's helping me, not only, but he's actually to kill all my idols. We say, oh, no, no, not too much. These Israelites, they believed in God. They wanted God to lead them into the, 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 the promised land. They wanted him to make them healthy. They wanted him to give them food and manna and, uh, and water. And if the water was not good, they would complain. They wanted him in their lives, but not too close. And the question is how many of us want God in their lives, but not too close? We ask God to lead us in, in, in our workplace and in our relationship and this and that. But when it comes very close to our most dearest objects in life and we realize he would kill it, we will say, Lord, uh, please, could you stop talking? Have you been in that? I have been in that place when I was studying music. I was studying orchestra conducting when I was young and I didn't have gray hair. <laughs> I was studying orchestra conducting and uh, I was reading a book um, on Ellen White and music. And I loved classical music. I was just, I was fascinated by classical music. I could spend hours and money into it. But then I read like how Jesus through Ellen White would condemn opera music. You know what I did with the book? Closed it, put it on the shelf, never read it for many years. Have you done the same? Oh, I could still be uh, pushing and, you know, against pop music and rock music and this and bad, you know, bad, bad, bad music, bad music. But in the back of my mind, I knew, you know, I am doing something that God condemns also. And this is what we often do. They were willing to listen or they were willing to obey written law, but they did not want to have God too close in their life. They basically said, Moses, go and write it all down. Write it down, and then we do it. Give us all the rules, but not the relationship with God. You would be surprised, but most, act most believers actually do want more rules that they can... We will ask the question, can I do this on Sabbath, yes or no? We want some rules that we can follow, and they should come from some high authority, but have you ever tried the adventure of having a true relationship with the Jesus? Now listen to these words in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Oh, that they, this is actually God speaking. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. The English translation is not the best. The Hebrew actually says, who could give them a heart to fear me? This is God saying, I came from heaven in fire, declared my love, declared war on sin, explained my character and they do not even want to listen. Who can give them a heart? If God gets desperate, things are pretty serious. Who can give them a heart? This day at Mount Sinai, when the people said, God, stop talking, tell us what we have to do on written form and we will do it. It was the birthday of what we call the Old Covenant. Have you heard about the term Old Covenant? Old Covenant? Okay, let's do some Bible study. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's understand what is the Old and the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter 8. Are you there? Hebrews 8, and we're reading from verse 6. 
And this will hopefully be very practical for your personal um, spiritual life. Hebrews chapter X, verse 6. And what we'll do is we'll read verse by verse, and I will ask you some simple questions, and you need to think about what is in the verse. Is that fair? Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. yes. Okay. Amen. Verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. First question. How many covenants are in this verse? At least two, right? At least two. And how are they compared to each other? One is better than the other. Can you see that? There's one is better and one is worse. Now, on what are both covenants based? Both are based on promises. The better covenant is based on better promises. So the worst covenant is based on worst promises. Question, are there worst promises in the Bible? Wait, you just read it. There are worse promises in the Bible. Because if there are better promises, there must be worse promises. Maybe you're like, yeah, what is he talking? Wait, stay with me. It's time to listen. There's a better covenant and a worse covenant. The one is based on better promises and the other is based on Worst promises. Okay, let's keep on. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Now, which one is the better? The first or the second? The second. The second. Okay, so the first one is worth. Is he actually bad? Yes or no? Is he bad, the second one, uh, uh, the first one? No. no, he's only worse. If someone gets 100% in his exam and the other gets 98 degree, he is still worse. He still may be good, but he's worse. He's not bad, but he's worse. So the first covenant is not bad, it's only worse. What is his problem? What's the problem of the first covenant? There is some fault. Therefore, by comparison, how can we characterize the second one? Foldless, because if the second one had a fold, what would have happened then? We had a, a third one, right? So the problem of the first is not that it's bad, but it's not perfect. It's imperfect. The first, the, so the worst covenant is imperfect and is built on worse promises, whereas the second one is perfect and built on better promises. Okay, verse 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So which of the one is now the new covenant? The better or the worse? The better. the better is the new covenant. By comparison, how do we call the worst covenant? The old covenant. The old covenant and the new covenant. Okay, let's go on. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they disregard, they did not continue my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. When was the old covenant instituted? What time and age? Listen to the text. When was it instituted? In the time of Eden? In the time of Noah? In the time of Moses. Can you see that? The old covenant was made in the time of Moses. Keep that in your mind. We're coming back to this just in a minute. Next verse. Let's understand the two covenants. What is the new covenant? Verse 10. For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There are three things now in verse 10, 11, and 12. How many things? Three things about the new covenant. In verse 10, we have the first thing. What is in the new covenant? Like, what does the covenant, the new covenant entail? The law of God is where? In the heart, in the mind. In the old covenant, where was the law? Of tables of stone, right? It was written on tables of stone. Okay. Maybe you can already see when God spoke 
the Ten Commandments. Did he want the Old or the New Covenant? Ah, he wanted the New Covenant, right? He wanted the heart. Okay, let's go on. So the, the law in the heart is a New Covenant. Verse 11. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to them of them to the greatest of them. How would you characterize this verse? What is said in this verse about the new covenant? What is the idea in this verse? Come on, what's the, what's the idea in that verse? The idea is that every member of the church has direct connection to God. Because in the Old Covenant, how was the connection to God? There was a human priest. Right? Amen? There was a human priest. So in the Old Covenant, you could not, only, you could not directly go into the sanctuary. There was a priest, a man between you and God. But in the New Covenant, is there any man between me and God? Any priest? Any pastor? No, any church elder? No, you can have a direct connection to God in the New Covenant. Okay, first thing was the law of God, in my mind. Second thing, direct connection with God. Third thing, verse 12. For I will be merciful to the unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. What is the substance of this verse? In the New Covenant we experience forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus. Amen? Question, is there forgiveness in the Old Covenant? Now think. I know it's late, but you need to think now. Was there forgiveness in the Old Covenant? Okay, we have a poll. Who says yes? Who says no? Who says, I'm... I don't know. <laughs> What is the substance of the New Covenant? God will forgive sins. What does the Bible teach about the Old Covenant? When an Israelite brought a victim and killed it, did the blood of the victim give forgiveness of sins? Yes or no? Yes or no? You're Seventh-day Adventist. Be bold about your belief. Yes or no? Even if it's wrong, but be bold. No. Because the blood of, 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 of lambs and, and, and animals cannot forgive sins. Everyone that ever was... Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. So was there forgiveness in the Old Testament times? Yes or no? How could a sinner be forgiven in Old Testament times? How? Through the blood of the animal? No, 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 no. Through what? Who is the only way to salvation? Jesus. Only through the blood of Jesus could anyone be forgiven. So the only way for salvation was in the new covenant. So what is the old covenant all about? Question. If the, old, if the new covenant, let's just summarize it. The, old the new covenant is the law of God in my mind. Direct connection to God and true forgiveness of sins. Which of these covenants is older? The new or the old? Which one is older? Yes. Yes, my friends. The new covenant is older. Because Adam and Eve and Abel lived in the new covenant. Because did Abram ever use a priest to approach God? No, there were no priests. And there were no written laws. They were not needed. So if the old covenant is younger than the new, why is it called the old covenant? There are two reasons. First of all, have you ever heard when Jesus says, I give you a new command, love your, you should love yourself? Was that a new command? No. no, very old. But 
they had forgotten it so much, it was actually kind of new to them. It was new light. Secondly, there is something that is actually making the new covenant new because the new covenant became eff legally effective when Jesus died on the cross. Before that, it was all based on promise. So all the Old Testament believers, they believed that someone would come and die for them, and based on their belief, they got forgiveness. But if Jesus would have gone back to heaven in Gethsemane, you know the Ellen White says the, the, the cup trembled in his hand, and he could have gone straight to heaven without any problem to himself. You know that Enoch and Elijah and Moses would have gone back to earth. There would have been all forgiveness that had been promised would have to be revoked. So basically, all forgiveness has always been on the new covenant because there's only one covenant. It's called the everlasting covenant. And that was the very covenant that God wanted to teach the Israelites at Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. Because there's no change in the Ten Commandments. It's only in the, in the heart or on the tablet of stone. No different laws. But when the people said, no, 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 God made a compromise. When the people said, we do not want the truth in our hearts, we want it only on paper, on stone. God gave them the truth in theory. The new covenant is the gospel in power. The old covenant is the gospel in theory. There are all the sacrifices. The written law, you can all read it. You can understand it, but there is no power in it. Let me explain it a little bit more practical. Who of you owns a washing machine? A washing machine at home? A few of you, okay. <laughs> what is a washing machine for? It washes the clothes to make them pure. If you buy a washing machine, you get a manual, right? What is in the manual? In the manual, you find the theory how the washing machine works. My friends, Jesus is a washing machine. The new covenant is the washing machine of God, and the old covenant was the manual. It only describes how the new covenant works. Every priest, every sacrifice, every jubilee fest, uh, feast in the, new, in, in, the, in the sanctuary, everything about the old covenant was pointing theoretically to the new covenant. Every lamb that was slain was a theory about Jesus. Every priest ministering was a theory about Jesus. The most ironic thing in the Bible is that the Pharisees would know the washing machine manual by heart while refusing to bring their clothes to the washing machine. The washing machine manual cannot make your clothes pure. It can teach you how to use the washing machine. So the old covenant is the gospel in theory. And that's fine. It is not bad. It has only a problem. It is worse than the gospel in power. Can you see that? The Ten Commandments are not bad if written on stone, but they are worse than the Ten Commandments written on my tablets of heart. Because if they're only written on stone, they're just on stone. Things written on stone will not change my heart if they're not written on my heart. Now, let me ask you a question. Oh, let me just back up. Let me get my water. Can you, can you guess 
What was the most important objective in the mind of Moses when he preached the book of Deuteronomy? Seeing that the people only had the gospel in theory. What was his greatest objective? Put the theory of the sacrificial system, put the theory of the Ten Commandments written in stone, put them into practice. Listen, you should love your God with all your heart, with all your mind. The entire book of Deuteronomy is Moses inspired try to bring the theory into practice. Could it be that something of this sort is needed today? Yes. Where a church is entrenched in good theory. We have heard it all. We know the health message better than everyone else on this planet. The problem is not that we need more information on how to live vegan. Our information should be more practical. The problem is that we don't follow what we know. Amen? We don't need more encouragement to do mission work. We all know it needs to be done. What we more need is uh, some more actual mission work that we do. Some more practice. Okay, let's go back to the promises. Why are there bad, uh, better promises and worse promises? Go with me to Exodus 24. In Exodus 24, we find how the old covenant was ratified. That's the legal term for made legally binding. In Acts, Exodus 24 and uh, verse 7. You could read the entire chapter, but for time's sake, we're just reading verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Question, is that a good answer, yes or no? Is it a good answer, yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes, it is a good answer, but it is unperfect. Because of the very same people, weeks later, they will dance around the golden calf. Why? If you read that sentence again, verse 7, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. What is that actually? How would you describe this? Is that a question? What is that? Is that a question? It is a? It's a promise. They promise to be obedient. It is a good promise, but it is not the perfect promise. In the Old Covenant, the promises are made by the people. Whereas, in the New Covenant, who is making the promises? God! It makes a difference whether I say, Lord, give me the Ten Commandments. Tell me what to do. I want to keep them. And God saying, on the other side, listen. Spend time with me and I will make you to do the commandments. Amen. Isn't that a difference? Amen. The one is good, but it will always fail. The only real way to success in spiritual advancement is if God is making the promises, not we. Amen. Have you ever been in that place? You made promises and promises and promises just to fail and to fail and to fail. That is precisely the old covenant. My friends, if the new covenant goes back to the time of Adam and Eve, could it be that the old covenant did not die on Calvary, but that many Christians? There are so many Adventists are actually living in the old covenant. We like righteousness by faith written on paper. We like the book Steps to Christ. We even give it to others. But the book Steps of Christ written on paper is only the old covenant. It becomes the new covenant if these words are written into our hearts. So as long as we say, Lord, tell us what to eat, how to dress, what to do, what to say, 
it, is, it will be a new covenant, uh, old covenant experience. The very moment where we change to, Lord, I am so weak. Help me. I will surrender my life to you and I will lean on your promises. Because you said it. What is the Bible says? Listen to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. The Bible says, Verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries and bring you to your own land. Verse 25, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgment and do them. That's a new covenant in the midst of the Old Testament. And my friends, our time is wrapping up. But that is exactly the gospel of the covenant in Moab. Let's go to Deuteronomy to the very end. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29, reading verse 1. I think that these chapters, chapters 29, chapter 30, and all these chapters should be our study. Because it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. That's another covenant. We all know of the covenant made at Sinai, but here another covenant was made in the land of Moab on the brink of the Jordan River shortly before they entered the goodly promised land, the covenant in Moab. Now, who is part of that covenant? Listen to verse 14. That's so fantastic. I make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. Ah, uh, you're sleepy. Who is part of that covenant? Everyone, because either you have been present or you have not been present, right? Whatever you do, everyone can be part of that covenant. Now, what is this covenant all about? Listen to verse 19. And so it may ha not happen when he hears the word of this curse, that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart, as though the drunkard should be included with the sober. The idea is that this covenant in Moab reaches the thought, it reaches the heart. No one can say, yes, 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 I believe the Sabbath, and still is breaking the Sabbath in his mind. No one is saying, oh, I don't commit adultery, but in his mind has impure thoughts. No one is saying, oh, no, I do not kill, but in his heart he has revengeful thoughts of others. This covenant is intended to purify the heart. Let's go to chapter 30. Reading from verse 1. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart, with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. This covenant starts with the gospel. God says, whatever you have done, if you have been scattered, if you have been bound by the enemy, if you have failed, I can reach you back. Amen. These are not only the Ten Commandments in the sense of, I need to do that and I need to do that. God realizes we will fail because we are sinful. And in this covenant, he is reaching out to you and says, I will bring you back. Listen to verse 4. Verse 4 needs to be on your refrigerator. Or somewhere where we read it over and over again. It says in verse 4, If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. My friend, it does not matter how far you have been gone from the Lord, how far you have been um, distanced yourself from the truth, where 
wherever you are, even if you're on the farthest end of the heavens, God is able to catch you. Too many think they have gone too far. Too many think they have sinned too much. Too many think there's no hope for them. The gospel of Moab, this true gospel says whatever you have done, how often you have done, God is willing, he is able to reach you where you are. Amen. Verse 5. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed. You shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. He will bless you. And then verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. You know, the Bible often says, circumcise your heart. Circumcise your heart. Circumcise your heart. By the way, do you know what circumcision means? Who was the first to be circumcised? Abraham. Remember the story? What chapter? Do you know what chapter he was circumcised for the first time? What chapter in Genesis was the circumcision given? It was given in Genesis 17. It was a story. Don't go there. We don't have time. But it was a story when Abraham, for 12 or 13 years, had a son called Ishmael. And he truly believed, this is my heir. God came to him and said, I will give you a son. Remember that story? Yes. I will give you a son. And what, what did Abraham say? Did he say, oh, yes, wonderful. What did he say? He said, oh, no, no, no. Hey, I, I have another idea. Could Ishmael be the son? You know what God said? No. There was an idea in the heart of Abraham, and God said, no. He circumcised his heart. If you have an idea that is against God's will, it must be circumcised. Uh -huh. And in order to show him that this may be painful, Abraham got outwardly circumcised. And so the Bible always says, circumcise your heart. Cut away the bad thoughts. But this verse is saying, who will circumcise our hearts? Listen again to this verse. Who will circumcise our, word, our, our hearts? It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. My friends, have you ever heard the prayer by Aaron White, Lord? Take my heart, for I cannot give it to you. Keep it pure for me, because I cannot keep it pure myself. The old covenant says, Lord, here's my heart. Give me your commandments. I will follow them. I will, pure, I will keep my heart pure. But the new covenant, taught by many failures, will say, Lord, I'm too weak. Take my heart and fill me with your Holy Spirit because I cannot go one step without you. You must keep me. You must be my righteousness. And then, in verse 11, for this commandment which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? In other words, God is saying, what God actually wants of you is not difficult. You don't need an expert that goes in a ship and brings you the commandments. You don't need someone that climbs to heaven and helps you. You all can do it. How? Verse 14. But the word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. You know, here is the key. Right now, as you think about these words, because they're in your thoughts, the power to do them is already there. If you believe that, it is done. Let me illustrate this to you. When you were in school, did you have uh, like, like 
sports in school? Like when we, in Germany, we had this high jump. You know high jump where you have this uh, uh, high jump and, and you, you're, you're running and uh, like you run and then you jump, right? Over the, over the, 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 the pole. For many, keeping the commandments is like high jump. Um, is, it, is it high or low? Very high, right? So people say, okay, let's keep the commandments. And they are running and they are jumping and are failing. Okay, let's try again. Hmm. They're running and they're jumping and they're failing. Then they say, okay, we need more, more time, right? More, more space. And they run with all their, their the power and they fail. And then they say, oh, maybe we should loosen the standard a little bit. <laughs> Lower the standard. No, 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 no. You know what this verse is saying? The Ten Commandments are not only a standard, but they are also, do you say in English, a trampoline? A trampoline? Because every command is, Ellen White would say, um, what, what are the other words? Um, let me just, I, I just uh, forgot it. Um, every command is, um, does anyone know? I just forgot the, uh, the, the quotation. Um, you just, oh, I just forgot it. Anyway, the idea is that every command brings with it the power to do it. Whenever all his biddings, here's a, here's a quotation, thank you. All his biddings are enablings. So the Ten Commandments are not only a standard that we need to cross, but the Ten Commandments are a standard with a trampoline that everyone using the power that has God given in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, in the Word, he can overcome simply. There's only one problem. If you use a trampoline, you cannot say, I was a good jumper. Right? If you use a trampoline, everyone can do it. And so many people will refuse the trampoline because they want to be selfish and they want to have the glory. But if you can get, if you can, uh, if you are okay with getting no glory, please use the trampoline. Look for the trampoline. And it's in the word itself. Because in the word there's life. Now, Paul understood this, and <clears throat> this is our closing, closing thought. Go with me to Romans. In Romans chapter, in Romans chapter mm, 10, yes. In Romans chapter 10, Paul is trying to explain what is righteousness by faith. And so he says in chapter 10, verse 5, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? Do you catch it? He's quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting the covenant in war. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Paul is saying, this covenant and Moab, which the Israelites actually agreed upon, that is the gospel of Romans. Oh, you're not excited. Paul is saying, I did not invent this gospel that I preached in Romans. It is the very thing the Israelites heard in the steps of Moab. It is the very thing when they heard it, accepted it, received it, they went into the promised land. Because the next thing, after Deuteronomy is Joshua, Jericho, the conquest of the promised land. What, need, what do we need to do? <clears throat> Why are we still here? Because the gospel that Paul preaches is to us more theory than power. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God. And if that power is seen, the people around us will say, you have a good life. I want that life as well. What we have too much are Adventists trying to keep commandments in their own strength and everything that can be seen is only strangeness. Yes, strange Adventists that are different, 
but not attractive. But what God wants to see is not only people that are different, but that are different so much because they have the better life. The life that everyone else is seeking for because Jesus is in his life and the Holy Spirit fills him and he is friendly and nice and happy. That is the life <clears throat> that Moses and Paul and John and all of them were experiencing. And they want us to have this experience as well. Amen. Who of you wants to say, I think I need to study Deuteronomy more. And I want to have this faith that Moses had. Amen? Amen? Shall we kneel for a closing prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have spoken to our hearts and that you have revealed something of this rich, wonderful book of Deuteronomy, which was most likely one of the most favorite books of Jesus himself. Thank you that it shows us many practical things for our personal life. Lord, help us to find time to listen to you and to be excited about your love, to, to soak in your message, to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that our lives may be a very shining witness to the power of the gospel. Lord, forgive us that too often we have tried to keep your standards in our own finite strength and we have not taken the time to connect to you, to be vitalized and refreshed and empowered to do the things that only you can do. So we want to commit ourselves to you, we want to pray with Ellen White, take my heart for I cannot, God, I cannot give it and keep it pure despite of myself because I cannot keep it myself. And we thank you that we know that you will answer this prayer because it's in your name. Amen.